All right, well, I guess we can start now. Uh, Ishan Kozla, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really are excited to have you uh, as part of uh, this beautiful conference. Uh, Ishan is actually the founding partner of Typecraft Initiative, uh, which develops typefaces from tribal arts uh, and folk crafts, which is super, super exciting. Um, I can't wait to actually hear you uh, today uh, on your talk called An Oasis of Type, Type Design of the People. Um, I can already relate a lot to, uh, you know, just the intro that you provided on, um, on the platform. So yeah, it's all you now. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Dina, and thank you, uh, HIPI, for having me here at this uh, amazing conference. Uh, and very unprecedented times. And thank you for people who've come to hear the talk. So I think we'll just start with the video and then follow up with any questions after that. Look forward to questions from everyone. Hello everyone, my name is Ashan Khosla. I'm a visual artist, designer, and educator based in India. I'm excited to be speaking at A-Type by 2020. Today I will be talking about an oasis of type, type design of the people. An oasis represents both abundance but also the barrenness that surrounds it. For much of the past century, modernism has imposed its Eurocentric principles to the world of design. The adoption of a more minimal and barren aesthetic aimed at banishing the lushness of ornament, which in Europe was associated with the excesses of the bourgeoisie, has had a numbing effect on a country such as India. Alice Twemlow, in her article in I Magazine, The Decriminalization of Ornament, talks about the fact that modernism removed any sort of meaning and function from ornament and in fact, in effect, made it appear to be obsolete. Adolf Loos's case for banning the ornament was based on his belief that a lesser civilized country, the lesser the civilized country, the more it uses ornament and hence the banishment of ornament would lead to a more progressive society. However, the fact remains that prior to the Industrial Revolution, ornament has been an important aspect of all cultures, both advanced and so-called less advanced ones. Decoration and intricacy are not only a mark of workmanship and skill developed over centuries, but it is also symbolic of identity and power. There's obviously a clash between how ornament is viewed in India versus in the West. In India, ornament is tantamount to beauty, abundance and vibrancy. Ornament and its implied complexity have an important role, especially in a multifaceted and diverse country such as India. Ornament in India has the core function to organize society and create pride and identity in a community. The Indian mind remains deeply colonized even today. The importation of Bauhausian and Swiss modernism after Indian independence has straight-jacketed its design sensibility, which couldn't be further away from the exuberance and the creative spontaneity one sees on the streets and villages of India. India is anything but minimal and sparse. The Indian instinct is to be expressive. Whether it is tattoos, bridal trousseaus, or trucks, we Indians have an innate love for the ornate and, and the idea of self-expression. India is not a less is more country. It is layered, nuanced, and is a complex patchwork of ideologies, belief systems, and cultures. The Typecraft Initiative then is a celebration of Asia's South, Asia, uh, South Asia's creative spirit. It was established in 2012 with the aim to not only provide livelihood to artisans, but also to inspire them to use design and technology to transform their craft to suit new audiences, contexts, and mediums. Simply put, Typecraft is about making typefaces from Indian crafts that are handmade by folk and tribal communities. This image depicts Goan tribal tattoos called Godna being transformed into a typeface that can be used on a computer. Creating a typeface from a craft is something new. However, Typecraft is not just about font design. Making typefaces one part of the work we do, a larger aspect of our work is to encourage inclusivity collaboration and authorship in the local communities we work with. Typecraft is about creating social value and bridging bonds between the urban and the rural, 
between the mainstream and the subaltern, and it is about breaking down stereotypes that divide craft and design. We start every project by asking craftswomen to take letter forms and to make letter forms by themselves based on their own crafts uh, without giving them any constraints. This gives them a chance to express themselves and have ownership of the project. Here we see an initial set of letters drawn by the tribal tattoo artists. While they are raw and unusable in their current form as a typeface, they provide a valuable insight into what sorts of elements could be included in the final typeface. However, craftswomen who work with materials such as textiles oftentimes struggle with drawing. For this reason, we conduct design methodology workshops to introduce craftswomen to design thinking techniques and give them the freedom to fail and learn about their own craft through the making of letters. The workshop is tailor-made for each craft based on its materiality and process. We use cheap and easy to manipulate materials such as paper and scissors. The process can be challenging and initially the craftswomen could only make very simple geometrical shapes as you can see in this image. Um, these women have never used a pen or a scissor, but over the course of the next few days, as you can see in the following slides, they managed to make interesting letter forms with paper and scissor. In fact, Nirmala, one of the more skilled craftswomen, even started designing the letter B by using a combination of paper cuts and drawing. Letters and type are an important are important from several perspectives. Firstly, since letters are decontextualized from the motifs and patterns the craftswomen are used to working with, it challenges them in new ways. Secondly, most craftswomen are still illiterate in India and the use and emphasis of the alphabet gets them interested in learning how to read and write. So Barmer Khatab and Marwari applique are two typefaces made from traditional botanical motifs that contrast the barren desert region from which the crafts originate. Next, we're going to look at Souf embroidery, which is a highly geometrical and uh, grid-based embroidery. Uh, our process of working with Souf craftswomen was different from Barmer, uh, as this embroidery is made up of shapes that are uh, derived from a triangle and used in various sizes. So what we did was we created kits of various uh, pre-cut shapes of letters made of paper, uh, which the craftswomen could use to construct letter forms. And this was an important step in giving them a sense of ownership uh, and where they could decide uh, the various forms that a letter could contain um, before making the embroideries. You must understand that, you know, most often craftspeople are just given a design to make. It insults their creativity and intelligence and we wanted to give them a chance to come up with their own designs and ideas, which also provides a fresh insight into the project. Um, of course, oftentimes what happens is that designers do have to come in and balance the original ideas that the craftswomen would have with uh, certain constraints that we that we, we face in uh, you know in, in font development uh, but also in terms of aesthetical uh, aspects where we may you know come up with different designs based on their designs so this, this is a balancing act that we have to do sometimes and that's challenging uh, it's one of the challenging aspects of type craft here we see some of the final uh, embroideries done by the craftswomen. The idea of community is at the heart of typecraft. This is not only from the perspective of collaboration and mutual respect, but also how society in many parts of India still organize in terms of caste and community. By embedding motives, patterns, and meaning that is relevant to each community, the typefaces represent a long lineage, a living tradition, and an identity that has developed over centuries. Women are the gatekeepers of the home and, and the community in villages and small towns across India. Their empowerment also ensures benefit to their children, the family, and the community. We're going to briefly look at some of the other typefaces we worked on. Each typeface is made from a craft or a tribal art which belongs to a specific region, material, process, and context. 
Here's Chitara, which is a floor and wall art applied outside the home as a sign of auspiciousness to welcome the gods. Chitara art is highly intricate, geometric, and abstract. We worked with Lada Radha Sulur of the Dewaru community in Karnataka, South India. Traditionally, this art was made with rice flour paste and clay paste. As you can see, Radha is applying outside her home. Uh, but like today, many crafts have become commercial and are sold as artworks. So this is a depiction of Lord Shiva on a chariot. Um, and then we've kind of overlaid it with typography just to see how letter forms could come up from these, uh, from these forms. Next, I'm going to talk about Godna or tribal tattoo art made into a Latin script typeface. This is done in collaboration with the Goan tribe of Chhattisgarh in central India. So tribals or Adivasi are the original people of India, uh, mainly uh, living in the forested and mountainous regions of the country. They use tattoos extensively on their bodies. And these tattoos have various functions that go beyond decoration. They're not only markers of identities and rites of passage, but also are used to heal diseases and ailments. Living in a tropical forest with many types of diseases, these tattoos were believed to have antibiotic qualities. We worked with Sunita, Ramkeli, and Sumitra from Chhattisgarh to create this typeface. Each tattoo, uh, you know, before we get into the actual type design process, we research the history, context, function, application, and the current scenario of the craft. So here we are looking at how the pigment is made, how the needles are clustered, how it is applied onto the skin, and then how is the skin finally treated with turmeric paste, what is the meaning of that and what is the function of that. Um, and each tattoo is codified in terms of design, placement, and when it is to be applied, um, as we have shown in this chart. The next stage is to actually work with the crafts uh, people without any constraints. As we discussed earlier, we initially asked them to make the letter forms themselves um, based on their own craft. Here we see the tattoo art becoming into an alphabet for the first time done by the, by the craftswomen. However, of course, this cannot be used as a font because of various reasons. The cap heights are variable, um, so you, you would have issues technically in, in making it work as a font. So what we do is we then give them a set of constraints in terms of cap heights, but also overall proportions and thicknesses of the letters. At this stage, we have a good sense of, you know, what are the sizes the women work at? What is the scale? Because each craft has its own scale that they work at. And that's something that is important to understand before proceeding. And then after this, uh, you know, they start making all the various letter forms. Um, since there were three women, we decided to work with three different uh, styles. And here you can see the three different styles done by the three different women. After this comes the stage of digitization, uh, where we scan the artwork and we then trace them and vectorize it. Um, we fix any inconsistencies or any irregularities, or if you think the proportions are off in some places. And then finally, we get into font development. Um, and as you can see, uh, so this is done in Glyphs app. And as you can see that this, uh, this typeface has a large number of nodes reflecting the complexity of the tattoos themselves. And that posed quite a lot of problems to us, but uh, we managed to work around by uh, disabling subroutines in the Glyph app. And uh, that enabled us to come up with a large uh, typeset, uh, font set, as you can see here, with an extended uh, character set as well. Dhebriya, Dhebriya Rabari Embroidery uh, is the next craft I'm going to talk about in collaboration with Bali Ben, Jenny Ben, Seju Ben, Parma Ben, and Dawal Ben. So the Rabari community are desert based nomadic and semi nomadic cattle herders, and uh, there are many subgroups. So we work with the Dhebriya Rabari group. Their embroideries are used for clothing, especially for women, but also for animals such as camel, coverings, etc. They migrated to Kutch in western uh, India from uh, the Thar Desert of Rajasthan. If you look at the embroidery, it is highly dense and uh, almost looks like applique because it's so dense and uh, there's a limited color palette. There are certain characteristics called danth. They're like teeth, like these teeth that stick out on the edges. Um, and that makes it highly, uh, you know, mesmerizing, I would say, in a sense. And these, these embroideries are used at the entrances of homes 
because the entrance of a home in India is considered extremely important. It's the place where you welcome a guest or a god into your house. And so this elaborate decoration is, is part of this ritual of welcoming someone into your home for the first time. Uh, because the women had a difficulty in drawing the letters in this case, and at this stage we had not worked out our uh, design methodology workshop, what we did was instead we started looking at motifs and designs in their environment, in their village, such as this W. It looks like a W uh, on a mud hut uh, in a Rabadi village. Um, this is from a textile, in fact. So it's not really a W, it's a motif that they use, but because it looks, resembles like one, we decided to use it as part of the alphabet. We also needed to strike a balance between the imperfection of the hand and the precision of the computer, as you can see in these slides. In conclusion, I'd like to talk about how the fact that folk crafts and tribal art have been, for the most part, been ignored by uh, graphic designers in India. By engaging with them through Typecraft, we are creating a much needed discourse on what constitutes Indian design. Importantly, this is an opportunity for design to make a real difference to craft communities and to itself by being enriched by the work of these communities before they merge into the mainstream. While crafts that we work with might have a long lineage and also evoke a sense of nostalgia, Typecraft is very much rooted in the present. Typecraft can make more of an impact as a tool for literacy and education by bringing local context and meaning. We endeavor a world where the children of the craftswomen can become literate from the very letters their mothers are making. One idea is to make a learning app that addresses rural communities in their own language, employing local crafts that emphasize folklore and mythology of the area as part of the education. The idea is to bring ownership of the digital content, content back to the village community. Alphabet quilts can also be used not only to teach children the alphabet, but also to sensitize them to the tactile world of uh, craft. These quilts would also lead to livelihood for the craftswomen and, and can help create value for local crafts across the country. On behalf of Andreo Balius and Saul Matas, uh, the other partners of the Typecraft Initiative, I would like to thank the uh, craftswomen from across the country who worked on the Typecraft Initiative till date. Um, our partner organizations, without whom we wouldn't have been able to do the work we love to do. I would also like to thank our past employees, interns, and most especially the volunteers for their contribution. Gracias, Shukriya, thank you very much for listening. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for such a, an amazing project and sharing all this with us. Um, I think this was really inspiring and beautiful in so many ways. Um, so let's hear from uh, what is happening on the chat. Um, so, Hmm. Actually, Fernanda is very interested in the process uh, in you've been answering as the talk was going. Uh, so how many people are in this team? And you just said it varies from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, Dean. Uh, uh, yeah, no, and thank you, Fernando, as well, and everyone for the questions. Uh, yeah, this is a highly collaborative project. I'm just one person. I mean, I kind of started the project, but... I'm, I'm just the face of it, but there are many, many people behind it. Uh, we have type developers, we have you know interns, and obviously the crafts people who are involved. So it depends, It uh, the size of the team varies from time to time. We have a lot of volunteers who sign up through uh, our website. We have students um, who, who are very fascinated by, by the project. They want to engage with you know rural communities living in a city. That's something that I think a lot of people want to engage with in India, with the handmade and with with certain uh, societies that we have disconnected ourselves with. So I think, yeah, so the team size does vary time to time. Yeah. Um, she also said, do you accept Brazilian volunteers? Yes, of course, we we have a team like, so we have uh, Andreo Balius and uh, Saul Matas who are part of the team there. Uh, you know, Saul is also uh, on anti this time. And 
they're both very active members of the type design community. So, and we also have people from around the world. In fact, a lot of them are from South America who have purchased our typefaces. Um, so it's a, it's the idea here is not just about India. It's about collaboration. It's about community. It's about working together uh, to create something of value. So yeah, more the merrier. Yeah, and I was going to say the community aspect of this project is truly impressive. Um, and just how everybody collaborates and connects in meaningful ways uh, makes it, you know, just something that really stands out completely. Um, Roxanne asks, do you think the project could eventually spread beyond India to other countries who still have traditional crafts? Yes, totally, Roxanne. I mean, the idea here is, I think diversity is one of the key words we're looking at. And so we want this to be a global movement where uh, it's ultimately it's a celebration of the handmade before we lose it. Like this idea of, you know, a lot of these communities, um, they use they, they use their hands and this is part of their tradition and uh, part of daily life. But because of globalization and other things, it's disappearing. And so we're trying to bring things back to the local communities and the local crafts. And so local can be India, but it can also be uh, Guatemala. It could be Iran. It could be anywhere in the world. So we are, we'd be happy to work with anyone anywhere in the world. So that's the idea. In Morocco, in yeah. Morocco, we actually have a long tradition of embroidery as well in the same way. And women are actually leading that. And I was wondering, uh, what is the role of women uh, precisely? Why don't we see other genders, for instance, participating uh, in these embroideries? Um, in Morocco, for instance, uh, it had a, um, how do you say that? Like a, a kind of almost a social critique uh, way and also a way to like get together and, um, and kind of empower each other. Um, so I was a bit more curious about that point. So, sorry, your question is about women, uh, how we work with women? Is that yeah, what, it's what is exactly the role of women in this project? Because they are leading this, essentially. Yes, yes. And I'm just sharing my video. Uh, I'm sharing a tab on my browser because Shiva asked a question about uh, like Latin scripts versus Indic scripts. So we are working in Indic scripts as well. I'm just showing that. Uh, role of women. Um, so in, in rural India, uh, you know, women, uh, there is obviously uh, uh, male dominance happening, like in many other traditional societies. And but the women are the ones who take care of the community. They, they make sure that the children are, you know, uh, basically going to school, they're fed, they're taken care of. Um, this is we work with local groups and they're known as non-governmental organizations or NGOs. And uh, these are what the groups say that, you know, if you support a woman, you will support the village. And ultimately it's the community, the family that benefits uh, because she will make sure as a mother that her children benefit from this. Um, and so that's why we've been uh, focusing on women. Um, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. So let's say another country wants to uh, chip in here and join the movement. How do you, how would they go for it? Yeah, so I mean, we always like to work with local groups. So if say you want to bring someone from your country, uh, then it would be nice that we also tie up with a group that is already engaged with this community over a long period of time. Because as designers, we cannot always be totally living in the village and be there all the time. So that's why we work with local NGOs who are like working on the field every day for many, many years. And that that is an important link between us uh, designers in the in the city and uh, craftswomen in the village who don't, for them, we are alien. Like who are we just coming to the village and working with them? So we need an interface uh, and that's a very important aspect of uh, our project. Absolutely. So which joins the question of Amanda again, saying how the project is sponsored mm -hmm. you are an NGO. <laughs> Yeah, so we are non-for-profit and uh, we are supported by different organizations, either NGOs support us, other NGOs, or I have another client from my commercial uh, work that I do. So one of my clients, they give us, it's a US company called Synergy Consulting. So they're an energy company and they basically fund 
these projects every year. They fund one project per year in the last few years through uh, CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. So do you want to elaborate on uh, the education aspect of it? Because it can be a teaching tool, as you said. Yes. Yeah, so the, the thing is, sadly, a lot of the craftspeople are still uh, illiterate. And not only craftspeople, but generally, uh, India still has a large illiterate population. That's one issue. The other issue is that I think uh, education in India is very decontextualized from uh, local, uh, you know, like, storytelling, mythology, we have such a rich culture, but our education is very colonized, let's say. Um, and through craft, maybe we can bring in local uh, meaning and uh, uh, storytelling into the whole process of learning a language. And that's the link we're trying to build uh, through this project. But it's complicated to get into education because there are many schools and many uh, boards and systems. So it's not that easy. We're still navigating that. It truly is fascinating. Um, yeah, it, it brings us back to how you started. Uh, you were talking here uh, about the Bajas and Swiss modernism, how uh, we are in, you know, in here, we're a completely different level. Um, and I mean, in many ways, like, of course, these are important movements in design, but it's a really great, um, it's a really great reminder that that's not just what it is. You know what I mean? Mm. Yes, exactly. I mean, India is a very diverse culture in any case, and and mm. our uh, and design education in India came through the Bauhaus and Swiss uh, systems uh, because at that time that was that was uh, you know modernism was the in thing in the '60s, and the idea was that this is how design can be trained. But I think it, in today's uh, era that it doesn't make sense as much. Like, I think we're still stuck to the Bauhausian uh, context in design education. And so that's something we need to, you know, question uh, uh, as a diverse country. What is Indian design? You know, I think the discourse is needed. Is, is there something like an Indian design? We're, because with so much diversity, as uh, India is as diverse as Europe, I would say, almost as diverse, you know, it's like a subcontinent. And so there are so many different cultural nuances and how do you navigate that uh, through design. Uh, so that's, yeah, I yeah. couldn't agree more, honestly. Yeah. And I think it's not just in the case of India, but everywhere in the world. I think there is a, a necessity to, uh, you know, like we, we, we've been passed on this tradition of uh, Eurocentric design, and it's about time to open up our world to uh, other perspectives, right? Um, yeah. so Fernanda asks, do you experience languages or cultural difficulties? Tell us about the challenges of such a project. Yes, and there's also a question by Roxanne, but I'll, I'll answer this one first. So yes, Fernando, uh, definitely that's a very good question. A lot of times, like especially when I visited the Rabari, you must have seen the Rabari typeface in uh, Kutch, which is in Western India. They speak a language which is different from what I speak. And uh, sometimes what happens is that the person is not there, a translator may not be always available every day. So you have to really manage through gestures and just, uh, you know, communicate in a very free manner almost by making things or doing things. Uh, it's challenging. It's within your own country that you have to face these, um, uh, you know, communication hurdles, but that's part of the joy and the challenge, I guess. So yes, we do face this quite a lot. Uh, and I think there was a question by Roxanne yeah. as well. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Rokin asked earlier, is there anywhere where you post the progress and results? I'd love to keep track of this. But yeah, I would love that too. <laughs> yes, yes uh, Roxanne, uh, the, the process and the progress is on our website, uh, which is at the, I could put it in here as well. We, all the projects and also of course on Instagram, uh, we post updates, but our website would be the best if you want detailed descriptions and the process. and. Uh, on this Instagram handle as well. Thank you all for all your comments and uh, questions. So you said that from one region to another, one community to another, um, these motifs actually, or ornaments actually change um, based on the culture. So how do you, uh, how do you invest, uh, whether emotionally, but also intellectually, to find out 
what they are uh, so that you actually can elevate that culture, but also respect it? Yes, um, I think that's a great question. Um, so I think what I tried to mention in the presentation was like the first step when we work with a community is to first to understand them. And I think there is, a, unfortunately, because of whatever it is, colonization or wh whatever reason, there is this tendency of a hierarchy because uh, we are coming from a city, we are a designer, we are English speaking, and they're from a village. They are poorer in quotes, uh, and they don't know. They may be illiterate. Uh, so th we don't want this. We don't want this division to happen. So it's really about uh, having mutual respect and really uh, having a having a true empathy and interest in their uh, in, in their life and their culture. Uh, it's almost like being an anthropologist, actually. So you have to start by um, asking, like learning from them. And I think the approach is not to a lot of times. Unfortunately, designers we think that oh, we're going to teach them. We're going to teach people how to make letters or how to become literate, but it's not that. It's it's not a top-down thing. It's really about being very democratic and being very humble. Also about the knowledge they have is you know what they know is much more in in their own system than I would know. So I'm illiterate in tattoos, for instance, right? They may be illiterate in English, but I'm illiterate in, in the in this in the symbolism of tattoos. So the first step is really to uh, be educated by them and understand their system and their iconography um, uh, uh, and the motives and the meaning behind it. And then uh, to slowly try to see what is the best way, uh, what process is the best way, because if some craftspeople, they draw or paint, then maybe for them drawing and is very easy, but then some people, they do embroidery, they cannot draw. So you have to find a new way to engage with them so they can express themselves visually, apart from embroidery, because embroidery takes time. We want quick. Uh, spontaneous uh, gestures, right, of the letter forms based on their craft. So that is the challenge we have to get over. And then it becomes more fun over time. Uh, initially, it's very intimidating for them as well. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's a navigation and it changes with each craft and each region we work with. And that's the challenge in India because there are thousands of crafts and areas to work in. I love that. I love your answer um, that, you know, it's all about co-designing actually uh, this experience together. Um, Fernanda asked, do you have a multidisciplinary team? Yes, uh, so I had uh, mentioned earlier that we have uh, two type uh, designers who are part of the team. This uh, Andrea Balias from Barcelona and Sol Matas uh, from, uh, she's in Berlin right now. And uh, so they, we three are the core uh, partners of the team, but then uh, yes, we have volunteers not only from India, but from outside India who've come in uh, either as, as interns or as volunteers or as employees to give their time. And interestingly, most of the people involved have been women, not only the craftsmen, but even the people who have volunteered their time and got involved. So that's an, an interesting outcome. Um, and it all, also another thing I should say is that in India, there is this barrier because uh, Dina, you had asked earlier a question about women. There is this barrier, especially when you go to a village. Um, sometimes women don't want to engage with a man, right? There's because there's it's a slightly more traditional society. So in that sense, when I go, the the whole uh, sometimes uh, there's a challenge because I'm a man coming into their space and trying to uh, interact. So that's why it's really helpful to have uh, people like you know women uh, interns and students, uh, even employees come and be part of the. Uh, you know, process. Even my wife has traveled with me, and you know, people respond much easier to another woman. Um, so that's how we we try to navigate. So I want to go back to a little point, uh, which is the major point actually that you mentioned earlier, which was about empathy. How do you think we can cultivate true empathy? Because you actually said the words true empathy um, in mm. these contexts. That's a tough one. I mean, I think it has to come from inside yourself. And it's really, uh, I always think that how how can I do something, I mean, in a humble way, where it's it's not about the awards or being on a type of, and, and, and I also feel guilty sometimes that I'm here, why is not one of the craftsperson here instead of me? It's really about uh, trying to do something where you really mean to make a difference, whether you can or it takes time. 
uh, and how do you persevere? We're now doing this for eight years. It's a lot of our own efforts. Uh, initially, the projects were all self-funded, but uh, over the last few years, we're getting funding now. So it's really about uh, your own passion and interest. Uh, one is it's a culturally, uh, it's such a rich country to engage in. I lived in the US for 12 years and coming back, that's how I got involved in, in this pro project. So one is the cultural aspect, but the other is that you also feel that, uh, you know, there's so much that uh, needs to happen uh, with craft and with, with the conditions that people are in. Uh, what can I do to help? I mean, not in a patronizing way, but in a way to push it further, like expose it to, let's say, people like you and other people outside the country. You know? So maybe tomorrow you may want to work with these uh, craftswomen yourself. So that's, so I don't know, it's a very tough kind of question to answer that what is, how do you get that? It comes from within. I think so. I think it's a really hard question to answer. But it's just something that we hear, uh, you know, just more often in the design world today. Uh, that you need to cultivate empathy if you want to work with communities. Uh, but it's also a very abstract notion to, you know, establish it within the design process. Um, and I completely agree that it actually comes from within and from uh, a true passion. Yeah. Um, which, which, you know, makes me think about what was so you were in the US and then you came back and then what really just sparked that in you to start this? I think I was always, yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I think I was always interested. I mean, I, when I did my MFA at School of Visual Arts, I did it on design education in India and, I, and uh, it was just a spontaneous thing of making letter forms from at that time it was not a font, but just making letter forms from Indian crafts. Uh, in a way to, to, because, you know, India, unfortunately, has the stereotype of Bollywood and truck art as the graphic language. And I wanted to say that, no, India is much richer than just that. Um, we are much, much deeper culture and there are much many more nuances. So how do I, as a graphic designer, I'm not a textile designer. Maybe if I was a textile designer, I would make rugs or, uh, or scarves or something else. But as a graphic designer, type is the language I play with. So how do I engage with my own country? Uh, through type. That's kind of how it all started. And just making, initially we just made letter forms. We did not make fonts. They were not functional. They were just letters. But that felt half done. I felt that the functionality aspect is really important, that it should be working and someone should could be able to type and use um, the letters, uh, you know, to actually communicate. And also I think there's another layer of how you're transforming one form of communication like tattoos and motifs which I, you know, in a short presentation, I couldn't, couldn't talk about that, but each of these motifs and tattoos have a meaning to that culture. And they're a form of communication like pictograms and proto writing, right? And we are now taking that and we are transforming that into a Latin script or an Indic script, which is another type of communication. So that's, which embeds these things into it, which is interesting, I think. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it completely is interesting. It's, it's really fascinating. I mean, um, in the Berber culture in Morocco, it's uh, very similar as well. Like every tattoo um, is a pictogram and symbolizes an entire story. Uh, so it, I can I can totally understand uh, what it means, what it feels. Do you want to tell us actually share part of the stories or the meaningful uh, um, pictograms that you came through? Something that really stood out to you in this process you know when you learned about the context and the content yes uh for sure uh, so for instance in the tattoos and it's on our website maybe i can try to pull it up if while talking so the tattoos uh, are very fascinating especially and there are some tattoos which are they look like scorpions and um, um i don't know if i can find an image but i'll keep talking till then and uh, basically, this, this, it's applied on the back, uh, on the upper back. And it's applied if you've been bitten by a scorpion. Um, so it's actually, it's, it, it embodies the energy of a scorpion and it's meant to protect you from a scorpion bite. So I thought some of these stories and anecdotes are very interesting, um, why they are applied and when they're used. Um, yeah, similarly in the embroideries, there are a lot of motifs that look like peacocks or even uh, uh, like, uh, you know, bushes or things with a lot of flowers because 
the embroideries we work with are in the desert. And uh, the peacock is a symbol of rain. Like a peacock dancing means that the, it's going to rain, a uh, monsoon or a rain is going to come. And so that's a very auspicious symbol because you are in a desert with dry climate. Like you said, Morocco, it's the same in, in that area. I've been to Morocco, so it's the same similar climate in Kutch and in some of these areas where you have these embroideries. So the peacock is a very, very important symbol. You know, so thing. I love that. And I'm curious, actually, because you worked with several communities, uh, what was, do you think, besides your project, something that actually connected all of them? Like all these various communities? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, what I find fascinating is our innate desire to express and to decorate to design, but it's not just decorate like without function. So I think in the Western sense, function and form have been separated, but in an Eastern sense, or at least in an Indian sense, they are together. There is a function within the form. Uh, so certain things are designed um, for a certain function. They may not be functional in terms of utilitarianism, but they are function function in terms of social function, um, or function in terms of uh, you know uh, maybe it's a festival. So it's it's praying for rain, or uh, or it's the tattoo to protect you. So the functions are a little more more subtle, right? Um, and I think that is common to all of these uh, cultures that we work with. And I think all cultures uh, in the world, in fact. I think there's yeah. a question from Fernando. Yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So Fernanda asked, uh, do the participants earn something from the projects? Uh, is there any commercialization and products? Yes, Fernando. So uh, good question again. So basically, the way it works is that we work through these NGOs, and these NGOs determine what are the funds that need to go uh, to the women. And so we, so initially the workshops is how we start the project and that's when they get paid. And then the second round of funding is when the typefaces are sold. So the typefaces are sold on our website. Uh, initially the fund, the funds from the typefaces cover any costs that could not be covered through, uh, our, uh, funders. So the funders that fund us, the money is meant for the crafts people, right? But then we also have our own expenses like travel or any other sort of expenses that we have, studio costs, et cetera. So that is first covered, and then any other uh, you know, sales covers more funds for the women. They get royalties, basically, on an ongoing basis. I don't know that, I hope that answers your question. So that's a two-step funding. I think so. I think it actually builds a, a sustainable system in that sense. Uh, yes. Where you give back to that community as well. Yes, and that's the idea. The idea really is that how do we create a cycle of income rather than just a one-off project, and which is why I didn't, initially I mentioned to you that I just did lettering with crafts, but I wanted to make something like something like a product, like a typeface, which can generate continuous income, you know, uh, for the communities. Hmm. I'm involved in a project in the Amazon region, Letras, Oh, um, it is a project working with boat painters. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. It'd be nice to see some of the results of that project. If, if you want to elaborate and then a little more on that, I'd actually love to know more. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> in... <laughs> thank you. I think foregrounding how the finances work would be worth including with the descriptions of the process on the website. I think so. Um, yeah. Because the aspect of, you know, we're not exploding a community, we're actually giving back to that community. And uh, and together yeah. we are building something that makes all of us shine is really important. Yes. We have mentioned uh, the financial part, but I'll, I'll look into what uh, Craig has mentioned. So it works it's not clear. Yeah. For Ken asks, do you continue working with the same crafters or does it happen that a crafter wants to continue working with you after the workshop? 
Yeah, so it depends from uh, community to community. So like, for instance, with the Barmer, uh, which is the uh, patchwork applique, uh, we worked through this NGO. What they're doing now is because um, I think it was a very successful workshop where we made the letters and the fonts. So now they're actually making cushion covers based on the alphabet that was designed there uh, with, with the craftswomen. So in that case, yes. So they're going to make products, which we have nothing to do with them. They're going to sell it and the money will go to them directly. Nothing is, uh, we have nothing to do with that whole process. So they can use the typefaces as they want and make the products and get income from that. Uh, but other communities, uh, it depends. Some communities are very in very remote areas. Uh, so it's maybe harder uh, to communicate with them and interact with them on a longer term basis. So it really depends on each case by case basis. But we try to work with uh, the people we've worked with before, at least engage with them and touch base with them to see how they're doing every now and then. So how do you exactly do that to keep contact? I mean, it is one of the hardest things uh, I feel in working with communities because it, it is all based on the relationship and you need to nourish that relationship so that it's not just a one-off thing and it's not broken up. Yeah, so that's a that's a big challenge, and again, there's the there are a lot of other barriers which is hard which are hard to explain on a uh, video chat like this. But in India, as I said, between a man and a woman, you know, rural and urban, there are these barriers. So I can't just call uh, one of the craftsmen and say, "Hey, how are you doing? How are things?" So I have to go through an intermediary. I have to usually go through an NGO and just check with them that you know uh, how are things? Are they getting enough work? Uh, do they need you know more projects? Uh, what you know basically that's how i touch base so i touch base through these uh, ngos and organizations and just make sure that everyone's uh, doing fine especially now in the troubling situation we're in yeah which uh, it was one of my questions or my curiosities how how can you continue this project in the times that we are now where we can't actually sit in the same room uh, and use the same tools and be close to each other in that sense. Yes, so it, that makes it very challenging. Um, in fact, we we are continuing to do Typecraft. Even now, we did a workshop about a month back with a new group of uh, uh, craftswomen. Um, so, I mean, we we follow certain protocols. We, we have social distancing, wear masks, you know, keep your hands clean. But you have to, because it is a hand, uh, crafts are so hands-on, you have to meet in person. So we did, we took the risk, if you want to call it that, and we met them a couple of times and, uh, you know, had a workshop, very quick workshop. And then, of course, everything is done on WhatsApp and uh, through the mobile phone. Um, that's usually the most common way of communicating in India. But it's challenging. It's not easy. Do you think it uh, changed... You know, from the from the earlier workshops that you've done, and Fernanda also asked, is the project going on in the pandemic? So yeah. So yeah, 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 of course. So what was the most challenging aspect of it actually by working in during in this pandemic? So I mean, I think one of the challenges is that uh, uh, so we're working with a group of women from a community called Mithila in Bihar, which is in the eastern part of India. It's they they do a lot of uh, folk painting. And they said that they've had no work during this pandemic. And uh, so they were really delighted to be, you know, to get this project and get some income. Uh, so that from that point of view, I felt great that, you know, okay, it was some small contribution we can make to them because they're really skilled and talented people, but then they, they're they not getting work. That's one. The other is the challenge is that uh, usually our workshops happen over a period of a few weeks. It's not just, okay, you meet one day and then you do a few letters and then you then that's it. There's a lot of back and forth, which we are missing right now because of the pandemic. So we, had, I mentioned we had these workshops, but they were just for two hours and then we would go our own way and then we would we would share things on WhatsApp, uh, either through voice or images. But then that doesn't, uh, it's, it's still taking, basically what's happening is the project is getting elongated. It's taking longer to finish the work that we would have taken otherwise to do. That's the challenge. I'm actually glad you found a way to make this happen regardless um, of the pandemic and just kind of adapted your process, even if it, it's taking longer. But um, 
I think it's really meaningful that you're still continuing this project, no matter what the conditions are. But that's just my point. Yeah. No, thank you. No, we're trying. It's not easy, though. It's quite challenging. But it's, yeah, we're trying our best. So we have a few minutes left. Uh, if someone still wants to ask a couple of questions um, and at the same time, um, um, I'm, you know, I'm wondering if there is something that you don't necessarily, um, like you haven't necessarily covered in a presentation that you would like to share with us. Uh, something that, you know, since you're doing this project, uh, made sense to you or that you have questions about or where do you think this could be going to even you know become a further uh or bigger project uh, in that sense yeah i mean what i'm hoping is that that's a great question again dina thank you for all the good questions uh, so i think what i'm hoping is that the international community like people here and others also get involved, like we have Saul and Andreo involved, but it would be nice to have even more designers and type designers involved because this is, it's, it's, it's a slow process. It's also a complicated process. I'm happy to be working here on the ground, but uh, it would be great to have more partners and others involved because it is quite challenging to work on it and it takes time. And then the other thing is because of all the complexity of the motives and the design, I, you might have seen in the presentation, there are a lot of nodes. And so we have to go around, you know, the technical aspects of type design as well. Um, so those are things where some help and assistance would be really great and appreciated. Uh, maybe we, we hope to do even a multicolor typeface. Um, so there are all sorts of things, but you know, we're a very small team in that sense. We are, the team size keeps changing. In a way we're like a you know, nomadic caravan. People come and then they join us and then they go their own ways and then others come and go. So uh, we're happy to have those sort of open relationships um, so that's, I think, one aspect is is this whole challenge of, uh, you know. And then the other thing would be great is if we can get uh, colleges and after the pandemic, obviously, colleges, students from around the world involved, and maybe we could have people come to India or we could do something online where we have interactions. I also teach, so it'd be great to have interactions between, you know, other cultures and Indian craftswomen, designers in India, et cetera, et cetera basically creating dialogue and discourse in different manners. So that's what we were hoping to get out of this as well. I love that. I love that. So essentially you're working, you're, you want type designers and you want uh, colleges to be involved in that or education to be involved with that. Um, yes, I want, to be, I want it to be owned by everyone. It's not my project. It's not, it's not, I'm just one person. Yes, I am the face of it today, but I want this to be a world project. I, that that's my dream that people around the world take it on and just run with it. You know, like it's not about India only. It's it's about all of us wanting to work with communities that work with their hands. Ultimately, it's that. And to before we lose some of these skills before they disappear, because a lot of them are disappearing, mm -hmm. we at least have some interaction, meaningful interaction, before they vanish. Uh, hopefully, they don't. Some of them survive, but. We don't know. I think that would be amazing. I mean, I personally teach at university at Buffalo, and uh, I would I would so love to collaborate in this project with our students. Uh, and Neda actually says the same thing. We will collaborate for sure. I have students from different parts of the world, mm -hmm. including India. Also, there you go. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> um, Sounds good. Yeah. Um, I think honestly, this was super inspiring um, and unique in so many ways. Um, Roxanne says that would be amazing. I've been trying to use more handcrafts in my own work, but it's difficult. Um, I mean, I feel like I feel like this was just fascinating in so many ways. I'm so glad that you know um, you're saying that you know at the end that before this would die, but actually you're working with this with these communities towards reviving that and keeping it alive. Um, so I'm so glad that you exist <laughs> and this type of initiative exists um, to perpetuate, you know, uh, true forms and genuine forms of culture. Um, 
And thank you, dear. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing this amazing project with us. Uh, thank you for all the participants and all the beautiful questions that we had. Uh, this was yes. really a beautiful moment. Um, and obviously, more people will be rewatching this uh, uh, talk. So uh, that's exciting to know that it will spread a bit more. Um, thank you so much, Ishan, again for uh, sharing this moment with us. Thank you, Dina. And thank you. Uh, oh. Thank you. No, and thank you to Taipei and also to all the uh, participants today. I really appreciate your inputs and interest in the project. And hopefully we can make this something bigger uh, and global while keeping it local. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's <laughs>